Today in criminal law, we'll be looking at a category of act requirements that we call crimes by omission. Now these are very rare. Uh, rarely in the United States is a person criminally culpable for a failure to act. Uh, and the fact, are, you know, compared to other nations that have derived their laws from the British common law, we're even less apt to apply uh, crimes by omission to a broad category of conduct. Uh, perhaps it's we imagine ourselves as a nation of rugged individualists and the, the, the obligation to care for others punishable by criminal law is just simply not something that has a prominent place in our law. However, there are times and places where criminal law has been uh, extended and is applied. But for a crime by omission to exist, uh, you need to have uh, two things in place. One is the statute either has to mention an omission specifically or by implication, meaning that there's nothing about the way the statute's worded that precludes a crime by omission, meaning that it, it uses language that is broader than, say, an affirmative act. Um, the second and perhaps most important thing is uh, that there has to be a corresponding duty to the omission. And uh, this is, you know, what distinguishes the way a crime by omission and a crime by commission, how each of them works. Um, the duties, um, it can range uh, from a variety of sources and their scopes can also be different depending upon the nature of the relationship or the nature of the duty. So, you know, generally speaking, there are five-ish categories of recognized duties. Um, this list can be reconstructed in different ways. Some extend it uh, by dividing up, say, voluntarily, voluntary assumption of responsibility. Um, others, you know, divide it or con um, contract certain categories together. Um, but for the most part, jurisdictions across the United States recognize these as sources of duties. There is a minority of jurisdictions, and I believe Texas might be the only one that only recognizes duties by statute. But for our purposes, these are the sources of duty. And so it's helpful to consider examples that fit within each category um, and what exactly is required uh, uh, for that category to be applicable. So statute, uh, importantly here, does not just mean that the crime includes the possibility of omission. That is the, the first thing that's needed for a crime by omission, but not uh, the second. The second thing is a duty, and so the duty has to be defined by statute, um, not just a mention. And, and so that would include explanation of the scope, where it applies. Um, and so, you know, this, for example, might exist in the context of a elder abuse or elder neglect statute. So as I'll talk about when we get to special relationships in the U.S., we don't ordinarily have a legal obligation punishable by criminal law to care for, say, our parents or uh, people who are related to us that are not children who cannot yet care for themselves. And so but yet it, it does happen, right? It does happen. People do, uh, you know, uh, end up taking care of their parents or whatever. But sometimes these situations are very neglectful, right? They don't um, uh, actually engage in um, uh, real care. Instead, there can be some, you know, uh, abuse through neglect. And these jurisdictions have sometimes, with these elder abuse statutes, included a provision that defines the scope of the duty, which says, you know, in these circumstances, you have an obligation to care, say, for a parent or elderly person. Um, and uh, some of it has to do with the assumption of responsibility, which is another category, but it can be defined by statute. And so they don't have to rely on these other sources, which are really common law and judge-based law derived. So that's an example of a statutory duty. Contract or employment responsibility is perhaps uh, best, uh, the, the common example and one that, that works well here is the lifeguard, right? If your duty, if you are a lifeguard, you have the duty to at least try to rescue people that are drowning, right? You cannot just sit there and watch them drown, wave to them and, and let them die. Whereas other people in that same circumstance can, at least as far as our criminal law is concerned. And so, uh, you know, this is why the, the first slide in this unit is the, the image of a hand out of water, um, presumably some 
already drowning, and, and we don't have an obligation universally to intervene in those circumstances. But lifeguards do, because that is their contract and or employment responsibility. And so if they fail to act, they can be criminally culpable. Uh, we also imagine other caretaking jobs here. So child care is an example. If you have a responsibility to watch over children, you don't, and something horrible happens to them, you might be criminally liable in those cases. The third category is special relationship, and most of the time we're thinking family relationship here, even though that's not the extent of it. And family relationship is also very narrow. Um, so it, among um, you know uh, family members, uh, our obligations are mostly directed, at least as far as criminal law is considered, uh, toward uh, small children um, and babies. Um, it, once a child reaches, you know, a, an age of maturity, um, those obligations uh, dissipate uh, to uh, nothing, basically, if they are uh, an adult. Uh, but even previous to that, they start decreasing over time. Uh, so certainly, if you have a child uh, by birth, by adoption, or um, some other mechanism, I'm not sure what that is, uh, then uh, you have an obligation to feed, uh, care for, maybe change diapers. And if you fail to do those and they cause criminal harm, right, that's associated with a criminal statute, uh, then that special relationship defines the duty. But you don't have obligations, as I mentioned before, to say your parents uh, normally, you don't, uh, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters. Uh, even your spouse, you might think, has very limited obligations between you two. However, you know, if you are alone with your spouse and they suddenly uh, become unconscious and start having a seizure, um, we might think you have an obligation to call 911 and render medical assistance uh, via uh, that mechanism. We'll, I'll talk about that a little more when we read Oliver and then at the end of this class section. So, yeah, our, our duties under special relationship are fairly narrow as well, and it's not merely enough to say, well, you're related. Um, it has to be more than that. Creation of danger um, is illustrated by, again, returning to the drowning person, right? So I said, in general, only lifeguards have a duty to go in and try and rescue somebody drowning. But you also have an obligation if you're the one that pushed them in the water um, and they are then drowning. So you've created the underlying danger and harm and you've now made it worse uh, by failing to render assistance. Now you might ask there, well, why, why are we even dealing with omissions in that context? Because if you push them in the water um, and they drown, aren't you already liable or criminally culpable for everything? Well, you might not have known when you pushed them, for example, that they couldn't swim. And so your initial commission didn't have a higher mens rea. And we'll, we'll get to mens rea soon enough. Um, but then once they shout to you from the water, I can't swim, I'm drowning, uh, suddenly things change. And now we're dealing with omission. So sure, there was always an assault or battery uh, by commission, but the omission kicks in uh, for potential homicide uh, when uh, you don't intervene after having created the danger. Our last category here, voluntary assumption of responsibility or redemption of aid, um, means that you are in some way uh, already uh, tried to render assistance and you might have an obligation to continue it. That, this isn't always true, right? So, you know, for example, if you are trying to give somebody CPR, there is a separate Good Samaritan law in torts dealing with this, but um, you don't have an obligation to continue forever, right? You know, it, at some point you might tire, uh, you might, um, you know, just believe there's no hope of, of their heart restarting and breathing to uh, commence again. But if you start it and tell everyone, you know, the other person who's there, go find somebody, call 911, and as soon as they leave the building, you stop CPR. Well, that's problematic, right? There you might have a continuing obligation because you remove the other person who might have been able to do the same, and uh, you've now isolated our uh, victim and uh, started to render assistance and then went further. But I also group this with voluntary assumption of responsibility, um, which can include things, for example, babysitting, right? So uh, even if you don't have a contract or employment responsibility, meaning there's no payment or, or a, you know, really agreement, it's just... Uh, the kids outside their house, they're locked out, um, they're a latchkey kid, and you're a neighbor, and you say, come on in, and uh, the kid comes over, um, but then you, you know, they're isolated from the world, they start, you know, having a, a medical, um, 
conditions such as say you know they couldn't get their insulin so they go into a diabetic shock you would have an obligation because you've assumed responsibility of that person by bringing them into your home in that situation and so these are our duties right and um, they're, they're not incredibly broad and they're going to be very fact specific in their application meaning even if we know a duty exists we have to look at the terms right is there a contract or is there employment here what is the nature of this special relationship and then the question of how what is the scope of the duty um, you know so let's return to an, one of our easy examples here of the lifeguard right a lifeguard has an obligation to try and rescue somebody but if you know anything about rescue it's actually quite difficult for somebody who's drowning uh, especially if the person's not a trained lifeguard and doesn't have say a separate raft or piece to keep the person afloat uh, the person who's drowning can often pull even a very well-trained swimmer down and so both people end up drowning um, you wouldn't have an obligation to risk your life and limb unless it's really clearly defined in the contract to that extent for the most part your scope would end you know in uh, following the procedures that are outlined in either the employment uh, or agreement or in sort of the norms of the profession um, so similarly doctors can't save all their patients but they do have an obligation when they agree to say engage in surgery to not stop in the middle and just leave the person there uh, on the operating table with their chest wide open so you know the scope of the duty is going to also be fact dependent um, and how much a person has to do talk a little bit more about this scope issue uh, at the end of the session here uh, when I get to failure to render medical assistance generally okay so because this is a narrow category we don't need to review a lot of cases it doesn't come up that much uh, so they're there there you know before we get to the cases though I want to make sure that in the US we do not have a general duty to rescue so this slide sort of an extreme version and it's it's kind of sad here right you know a person sees uh, what appears to be a some sort of stereotypical serial killer washing blood off of his car with an open trunk and blood all over him and they walk away now this is you know not a real scenario but if it were would our uh, civilian here have an obligation to intervene and beat the the serial killer looking person up no I, I don't think under any view of a duty to rescue uh, that would be required because presumably this person who who is a killer and our civilian who if they were unarmed would not have an obligation to intervene however we might contemplate well do they have an obligation to at least call 911 and report this and the answer is still no here but at least there's some people who think maybe we should change that maybe we should have an obligation because of modern technology in the ease of summoning authorities um, maybe you should be required to report in those circumstances but that's not the case now you may have heard of what are called good Samaritan or strangely bad Samaritan laws um, perhaps the most famous depiction of these was in the finale of Seinfeld um, and it's true some jurisdictions do have a low-level crime that requires uh, you know very limited duties uh, to intervene in certain criminal uh, uh, situations and it might include just calling 911 I think the Seinfeld uh, episode actually is a, is a poor illustration of it if you've actually seen it or not um, because even though our, our Seinfeld defendants here are um, not helping the situation in fact they're recording and mocking somebody for being overweight um, when they're a victim of a crime in fact this was an armed robbery and they would not have have an obligation to intervene in, in an armed robbery situation unless they were say police officers or had some contractual duty um, and that's how it's sort of depicted in the show which is kind of crazy but we could have a statute or ordinance that uh, requires say a reporting of such an event um, so that maybe the police could intervene um, with all that being said these ordinances are, are usually uh, few in the US they're localized um, and their scopes of duty are quite small and are generally not applied so it's it's accurate to say there is not any generalized duty to rescue in the US and even the narrow duties to not say rescue but report are unusual and outliers in the United States so what about um, our cases here well, we have one that's that's sort of a classic one even though it's not that old and in, in uh, you know it's 1989 isn't too long ago uh, but this is taught in almost every criminal law class because it's a a helpful fact pattern to understand you know the the dynamics of um, 
a duty that sort of emerges uh, here. It wasn't uh, pre-existing, it wasn't defined by statute, but it emerges in the course of uh, the facts here. And so, you know, Oliver, our defendant, meets somebody at a bar. Uh, she goes to her home with him. Um, you know, they, they, he's intoxicated. Uh, and he asks for a spoon. Uh, presumably, uh, it's it's unclear how much she knows what he's going to do with it. Uh, and um, but it does. That's a mens rea issue. We don't want to think about her knowledge and understanding of the process of shooting up uh, for purposes of analyzing the omission here. Uh, but she knew it was for drug use. Just I'm saying you know, the, the specifics or how much danger was represented. That's that's not something we want to consider. So uh, he goes into the bathroom and shoots up and collapses on the floor, at, and he, she's unable to wake him. Um, at that point, uh, perhaps being a, a, a very poor uh, date, she abandons him um, and goes back to go out and have fun. Uh, and she is at the bar, and she gets a call uh, from uh, her daughter, and uh, who, along with the daughter's friends, have discovered this uh, collapsed, passed out man on uh, the ground. Oliver, again, being one of the worst states in history, uh, doesn't tell her daughter to call an ambulance or to check on him any further. Instead, she instructs them to drag him outside and put him behind a shed, uh, presumably to keep him out of sight of the neighbors. Uh, he was snoring at this time, so at this point we believe he is still alive. Um, and uh, the Oliver and um, someone else check on him later, and he also still appeared to be alive. Um, officers do find the drug paraphernalia, and the man is determined to have died from morphine poisoning. Um, you know, all opiates convert to morphine in the bloodstream, and so this is uh, an overdose. Uh, and so uh, was uh, Oliver here liable for uh, his death? And... You know, one view, and the sort of strong, rugged individualist view, would be, no, why should she be liable? Because he self-inflicted his own uh, death here, right? He didn't maybe mean to, but he asked for the spoon, he took a substance that is dangerous and injected it into his arm. And that's one view, uh, that um, this should fall wholly on uh, Corneo, the, the victim in this case. But I, I want to take a, a moment here as an aside to point out that criminal law, unlike tort law, does not require a division of culpability. So in tort law, we have doctrines like comparative liability, uh, which try to assign a certain measure or percentage of uh, responsibility uh, for causing uh, some harm uh, that is actionable in the U.S. Criminal law doesn't do pr approach harm or causation or things like that in the same way. Uh, it could be that, you know, in, and we'll see this especially when we get to conspiracy, every person is fully and completely liable. We don't divide up the prison sentence among multiple people. Everyone can have the maximum or minimum penalty uh, associated with the law. That's as true as well here. Just because we think Corneo has responsibility, and a lot of it, that in no way reflects on Oliver's responsibility, right? They are independent in this regard. And so... Um, we don't need to view it as a trade-off, right? That if, if we decide that she's responsible, that's somehow uh, excusing uh, what uh, our victim did here uh, to himself and, and vice versa. Just because we think he's only responsible, that doesn't excuse Oliver. And so there isn't a zero-sum uh, responsibility uh, uh, dynamic or relationship here. And so what does that mean for us? Well, that means Oliver, we can look at independently and see... Is she responsible for his death? Now, the homicide statute itself requires causation. So we're going to assume that that's proven beyond a reasonable doubt here, meaning that uh, the experts could testify in the case that the failure to get him medical assistance uh, was uh, approximate cause of his death um, and a but-for cause of his death, meaning you know that whatever causation rule we use, and we'll get to those later in the semester, uh, she is part of what made him die. And so now we need to decide, is, what's, does she have a duty? And what was the scope of that duty? 
And admittedly, the court here is not super clear, right? The court does not go through, say, the list of duties that I outlined earlier. In fact, their their language about the duty is a little uh, opaque. Um, and uh, yet, they, they do reach the conclusion that a duty applies here. And so one thing we want to think about in class is, what category does this, that, this fit under? Does it fit under more than one? And what is the scope of that duty? Now, I think we can, we can assume the scope here is calling 911 or getting medical help, right? If there was a neighbor, doctor, something akin to that. Now, this case is taught in many criminal law books with a companion case from the early 20th century, which reaches the opposite result. And one of the reasons I don't teach it is it's very much a product of the technology of the time, right? There was no 911 service. There wasn't easy access to telephones. And in this case, a man who was uh, on a um, tryst with his uh, mistress, as the, the story goes, uh, you know, she similarly was, like Cornelia was... Uh, it, using uh, a substance that ultimately caused her death, and he did not provide medical assistance. But at that time, the scope of the duty was very different. And so the cases aren't really as contrasting. And, and I want us to focus more on the modern law. And nowadays, uh, the, the existence of the 911 service um, and the easier access to uh, medicine, uh, so that you could also drive somebody to the hospital, particularly if it's nearby. Uh, you know, the earlier case doesn't really deal with an era where uh, hospitals are everywhere and motor vehicles exist. So they exist, but they're not common. And so uh, this is uh, uh, this is the world we live in now, right? And so now that there's easier access to medical care, the scope of the duty um, is often linked to that. And so I think because the, the government can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that all Oliver was at least a, a cause, not the exclusive cause, but a cause of uh, the victim's death. Uh, and the duty exists to either she had to uh, call 911 or uh, maybe your daughter did. Now, some people ask, well, is the daughter liable and the other friends there? I mean, they could be. There would be nothing precluding that. I think one reason to believe that... Um, they shouldn't be held liable, and the reason they shouldn't be prosecuted, it's not clear they ever knew why he was unconscious and that he hadn't just, you know, he wasn't just snoring from deep sleep or something like that. Uh, you might also ask, well, what, what about dragging him outside? You know, is that a act by commission? Well, yeah, if he had hit like a rock while they were dragging him across the ground and it split open his head, that would have been a cause of his death. But it's really the fact that they secluded in this home with no access to medical care and the duty that, that to... Uh, provide that care is what's violated. Oliver is somewhat controversial still. There's some people who criticize it, but not really. I think mo jurisdictions now have said in instances like this, the obligation is, is fairly narrow. And uh, so we do see prosecutions here when uh, individuals do not get medical care for an overdosing person that they know have overdosed. Okay, so that's Oliver. Now we get to Fuller, and Fuller is a much tougher case. Uh, it might not seem as so, but I think we, we once we think it through, I'm not sure every jurisdiction or court would reach this result. Um, it is a difficult situation. So let me give you a little background here about child support and child support recovery. Child support um, obligations emerge typically through divorce, and uh, one person who's not the primary uh, um, caretaker or guardian of the child and uh, who you know has a source of income is obligated to pay uh, to uh, for the child's care at least in part and uh, delinquency and failure to pay child support was a, was a major problem, um, and it, it has been. But I'm talking about specifically at the moment that Congress passed the Child Support Recovery Act. Um, there were many reasons why. One is is it largely put the onus, or law at the time, uh, largely put the onus on uh, the caretaking parent, the guardian, um, who had primary or, or joint custody, um, to continually go back to family court and try and get orders, you know, for delinquency and then get those executed. And it just was an enormous burden. They had to pay the legal fees. And it often wasn't effective, particularly as uh, when um, the, the delinquent parent uh, fled the jurisdiction. And so we saw some states try to criminalize it. And uh, again, the flight between jurisdictions complicated this, getting extradition. But there was also, you know, criminalization was not an obviously good answer to this problem. And this is true even when Congress enacts it, because if criminalization is going to carry 
punishment, which is presumably it would have to, that punishment itself undermines uh, child care, typically. So if it's a fine, a monetary fine, um, that is, you know, if it goes to the government, that is only trading off with money that would go to the child. If it's just the form of restitution, well, then it's no different than the tort system. It just has criminal teeth there. And it's really, uh, I mean, you know, presumably if they didn't pay at that point. But ultimately, at some point, what has to be triggered in the criminal system is either a larger deterrent or some higher form of retribution, which usually takes the form of prisoner jail. And at that point, uh, our delinquent parent is not providing any money, uh, usually, unless they have assets that they've been hiding and are, been gaining um, uh, income revenue or something uh, along those lines. The, the overwhelming majority of our cases, incarceration is going to decrease the amount of child support available. And so this is a very imperfect and controversial solution to the problem um, because if we start prosecuting delinquent parents, um, then the child who the law is, is designed to provide greater resources for is actually uh, hurt at, at least as much as the, the status quo environment before the prosecution. So um, with that background there, Congress decides we need to intervene, particularly because of these cross-state issues, and when the delinquency reaches a certain threshold. So in this case, it had to be unpaid for over two years and greater than $10,000 owed. So the, the uh, criminal justice system is not intervening in most uh, custody related child support issues uh, those will still be through family court here or through state criminal law if they apply in a, a narrower circumstance it's only after an incredibly long period of delinquency and a accumulation of a high amount uh, that the federal statute can apply and so here our defendant fuller is prosecuted and convicted because he hasn't paid and it's been over two years but there's a problem here, and the problem is not that the, he hasn't done that. That's the omission part, right? The omission is the failure to pay, right? He has not done so, and the question is the duty, right? The duty here is really hard to nail down. That's the second part of any omission analysis, and you have to get to it because we, we know he has a duty, right? We know he has a duty to pay child support, but that child support amount is linked to his ability to pay. So, for example, if he's unemployed for a long stretch of time and has no income, and he might be living on the street in this case, um, he would have no obligation to pay during that period. Now, ideally, he should be going to family court and getting a finding to that effect um, and so that the child support amount is decreased or adjusted for that time period. But that's not necessary um, for our criminal law analysis, right? It's not that criminal law is just piggybacking on the family law finding here. It is to some degree in terms of the amount owed, but it's not that the criminal justice system is, you know, deals with this failure to pay issue. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the inability to pay issue uh, through an obvious linkage uh, to the family court findings. And the real difficulty here are, is the facts of this case, because at the time uh, that the custody arrangement is is initially made and the obligation to support um, is created, our uh, defendant has a job that's reasonably well paying, right? You know, he has a, a something that that pays income, but uh, he decides to pursue uh, a a music career, right? Something that is almost certainly doomed to fail. And as we know, in hindsight, it did fail. Um, in fact, the the amount of money that uh, he earned, or at least that the other parent could document he earned here, um, is just ridiculously low. Um, you know, over the course of an incredibly long period of time, he is, doesn't seem to be even earning enough to care for himself. And so, you know, against this backdrop of him earning almost nothing in his music career, uh, he accumulates uh, $53,778.36 um, that uh, is owed, and that's what's ordered to be owed at the trial court level. Um, and then he's put under probation uh, for five years. And, you know, that's a sentence. And, of course, if he violates his probation, then the incarceration uh, would kick in. And against that, the 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 only thing that the government can really prove that he's earned during this time is $5,200 over the 17 years in which the support order was in effect. I mean, that is a ridiculously low income. Now, we can fault him for pursuing this music career. We can fault him for uh, abandoning a pain a job to do it. 
I think the court might be a little um, overly generous, assuming that that the paying job that he previously had would have been there for out the 17 years and that he would have had steady employment during that time. That might be a little too optimistic um, for anyone uh, in, in virtually any industry. Um, but this is a problem, right? Because what the court's saying here is he not just that he has an obligation to pay child support. We all agree on that. The question is what he has to do to make him have the ability to pay, right? Because his obligation to pay child support generally is excused in family court, court if he doesn't have an ability to pay. And here the court's saying he did have an ability to pay, more or less as far as criminal law is concerned. And it was only by his conscious choice to pursue a, a awful music career that went nowhere uh, that he accumulated this uh, massive amount of money owed in child support. And so the scope of the duty is where this case is controversial and where it's difficult, right? We know there's a special relationship because of the father-child. There even is a, a legal order supporting this uh, obligation. But at least as far as the government can prove beyond a reasonable doubt, this doesn't seem like he could actually pay the amount. So what the government's really arguing and what the Tenth Circuit allows here is to say he actually had a duty to earn uh, the money uh, that would have led to the payments of the delinquent child support. And that is, as I said, a, a stretch of our general scope of duties. It is an unusual holding. I said I'm not sure if other courts would reach the same result, but I can't really say otherwise. I looked for other cases in this area. There aren't many. Uh, rarely are these cases prosecuted for some of the policy reasons I mentioned at the outset. And it's just difficult to know how often, say, the threat of criminal prosecution then causes uh, our potential defendant to come to the table and try and find the money and work out um, some form of agreement. And it might be that the scope of this duty is entirely unique to the child support context, but it's an important area of, of newer criminal law because the criminalization of delinquent child support is a new thing. It is not something that, that everyone agrees should be done. There's a lot of family lawyers and people who practice in the area that thinks the specter of criminal law only makes things worse. But there's some people that feel like it's just needed at these in these extreme cases of long-term delinquency with accumulated amount and we shouldn't keep putting the burden over and over on the parent who's the caretaker uh, to go back and constantly uh, pursue um, orders uh, from family court from the delinquent parent. So these are two cases that show us different boundaries, different relationships, and crimes by omission. But in general, these are rarely uh, an, at issue in a case. We'll look at some examples throughout the semester to continue to, to add to um, your sort of arsenal of omission cases. But this is enough to provide uh, a basic backdrop. Now, I did want to return to the general idea of the failure to provide medical assistance. Um, and I, I want to just highlight again how this has changed over time, I think, because of technology. So you normally will not have an obligation to, say, give somebody CPR. You will not have an obligation to drive them to an hospital. Um, but in the narrow circumstances where one of our duties has, has attached, calling 911, getting an ambulance, um, that seems like a very modest duty, right? It, it seems like something that is not extreme. And so as a result, uh, this, uh, I think it's been easier for courts and prosecutors uh, and juries to say, yeah, this, this duty was violated. We can say there was a failure to provide medical assistance in cases like Oliver or cases where somebody's secluded or isolated. Um, and so this is something, this is an area where uh, crimes by omission have, have become a little more prominent. And I think it's just because of the, the development of technology and a development of the 911 system. So that's it for crimes by omission. We're going to look at uh, examples in class and talk a little bit further, but this should provide you uh, the basics of the doctrine. You need omission to be uh, at least permissive, permitted uh, either explicitly or implicitly by the statute. You need a corresponding duty, and you need to remember to think about the scope of that duty to see if it includes uh, what the defendant didn't do, their failure to act. Uh, so that's it for today.